Hey everyone, this is Mike Wolf, and welcome to the Food Tech Show. Today's guest is Max Elder, co-founder of a new company called Nowadays, a company that is making plant-based meat, in particular, plant-based chicken. I've known Max for a few years now. I first got to meet him when he was a futurist for the Institute for the Future. For those of you who know The Spoon and, and follow some of our events, you probably remember Max did a workshop on how to be basically a food futurist for us about a year ago. So you may be familiar with his work there, but he soon left that gig and went into stealth mode. And yeah, I was bugging him the, the last year. He's going, what's, what's going on, Max? What are you doing? And uh, like a good founder in stealth mode, he didn't tell me, but he said he would be able to talk soon. And that talking is happening this week. They lifted up the veil, announced the company. And so I decided to have a chat with Max and hear what he's up to. We did the conversation as is usual these days on Clubhouse. I had a lot of fun talking with Max. So you can hear the full conversation here. If you want to check out Max's website and nowadays and what they're building, just go to eatnowadays.com. All right, folks, that's it for now. Let's talk to Max. We're going to get going and uh, we'll record this. So this will actually go out as a podcast. So people that do join, they want to ask questions of, of Max or myself, feel free to do that. But uh, Max, I th- yeah, so you came and we did a workshop, I think, about how to become a futurist. So you were working for uh, an organization called Institute for the Future. That's so right. You were a futurist. You, you built. Still am. Yeah. And so, yeah. So it's something that comes in naturally to you, but you also had as a profession, like these frameworks and structures to basically in a disciplined way, look into the future. And I would imagine one of the things you saw as you looked into the future was plant-based food is going to become a much bigger thing. (laughs) Yes. Yes, totally. Yeah. So Michael, one of my favorite uh, quotes is from a science fiction writer named William Gibson. Have you read any William Gibson? It's been a long time. It's been a minute. Yeah. So, well, he's got this great this great line that futurists love to talk about, which is that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Yeah. And I really think that that's the case with plant-based meats. Like it's already here. Uh, these, the technology exists. The problem is it's not very evenly distributed. The problem is that in the U S they still hover plant-based meats in aggregate around maybe one, one and a half percent of the total meat market. So they're here. There's just this weird problem. It seems like they're not getting the market share that they that they deserve or that honestly the world and that people and the animals need. So the the real question, if you're a really good futurist, is to figure out how to make better decisions in the present. And I spent many years doing long term strategy and innovation work across the food system and realized the better decision we have to make in the present is figuring out how to scale affordable, accessible, appealing and nutritious plant based meats. So it's really easy to be like an industry watcher. I'm one of those people like, you know, I I was an analyst for a long time consultant and it's way easier to to kind of observe what's going on than actually jump in and and like roll your your sleeves up and actually make something. So like, and not to say that like being a futurist at the Institute for the future isn't hard, right? Like that's like a really cool sounding job, but you decided (laughs) to leave this really cool sounding job that, you know, you could tell people at parties and they go, wow, you're a futurist and, and jump into the ring and become a plant-based uh, meat entrepreneur. Why, why did you decide to make that? Was it like, okay, sitting on the sidelines, I'm not going to uh, affect enough change. What were, what was the reason behind that? I did it for the parties. Like, <laughs> the par- I did, There's so many parties I, in plant-based. It cool it's like parties. Hollywood. <laughs> no, you know, the, um, the answer is honestly that I have been thinking about starting a food company for a long time and started working at the Institute for the future to get more experience across the global food value chain. Um, but honestly, what happened was the pandemic, uh, COVID, COVID both slowed me down, uh, from traveling, but also really underscored some urgency in no longer consulting for the, the Nestle's and Hershey's and Campbell's and General Mills of the world. Um, but instead do something on my own. And part of that was just like a very salient moment where, I was living in I was in San Francisco, living in Hayes Valley. I was a few blocks away from sort of downtown um, Civic Center, and there were massive riots going on for fighting for racial justice. The there were fires uh, not too far north of me, and the pandemic. Uh, we were under a curfew, 
and I was at in my apartment. There were helicopters flying over my head. Um, there was smoke outside. I was getting my iPhone had a buzz that said, you know, don't go outside. <laughs> the world's and I was on fire for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, it, like the world was too much with me at that moment. But I just I was sitting down for dinner and realized, like, gosh, I see food is so much at the intersection of all of these things going on around me. And it's time to stop um, being the cool futurist at the party, <laughs> telling uh, telling these companies how they might think about embedding sustainability or animal welfare or innovation into their strategies, but instead just do it do it myself. Wow. So you can kind of almost crystallize it down to like a moment you had that. Um, just uh, epiphany moment. That's really cool. And it doesn't hurt as a futurist, uh, as working for an institution like the Institute for the Future, pretty well known. I would imagine you built a decent Rolodex. We could jump into a little bit how you built it and maybe hear about kind of connections you made. But I think we kind of maybe skipped uh, the headline. So let's just go back a little bit. It is a company called Nowadays. For those who aren't familiar with what Max is building, you're the co-founder. And I think in the press release, you guys are looking to basically replace junk food with uh, basically a plant-based chicken nugget. That's your first product, right? Yes, that's our first product. So tell so, us about tell us about the nuggets. Yeah, well, so first, Nowadays is really a company that's trying to do something very different. We looked across the landscape, me and my co-founder, Dominic Grabinski, who's much older than me, much wiser, and sounds better. He's a Frenchman. He, uh, he spent his career at Cargill and DSM, these big multinational food companies. Uh, and he knows the sort of industrial ingredient landscape very well and how to basically make food that can be commercialized. And uh, we met and we sat down and we tried to think about how we could have impact at scale. And nowadays is really born out of this assumption that most consumers don't really want just plant-based meat, that removing animals from these products isn't enough. And despite one of the biggest IPOs of the past couple of decades with Beyond Meat, despite Impossible Foods raising, gosh, I think at this point, like one and a half billion dollars of private of venture capital. Um, you know, the meat, the alternative meat market really hasn't taken off like I would hope or like I would expect. The growth rates year over year are amazing. But honestly, we're, we're still, when you look at the market, we're a rounding error. And one of the reasons we think that's the case is price, which we should talk about. The other, though, I think is that value propositions really don't speak to consumers. They speak to vegans. Um, they speak to, to vegetarians. But to mainstream consumers, the majority of people who are flexitarian, who are looking for a, an occasional plant-based meat alternative, are doing it for health. And nowadays was really started to make plant-based meat that is as good for you as it is for the planet. And so that's what we're doing. We're targeting junk food categories first. The nugget is sort of the sexiest uh, example of a pretty horrible product. I've never heard like nugget chicken nuggets called sexy, but okay. Sexy. <laughs> oh, Michael, come on. They're, they're, they, nuggets, for whatever reason, have captured the consumer zeitgeist. People love them. They're obsessed with them. You should go deep into nugget TikTok. It's a thing. Um, so nuggets have a very emotional pull on a lot of American consumers, but they're also full of junk uh, mm -hmm. across the aisle, animal-based and plant-based nuggets. They're junk food. Uh, everyone knows that. People who feed their kids nuggets know that they're junk food. People, people eat nuggets despite what they are, not because of what they are. And to me, that's the best type, type of category to enter when you're launching a company. It's a, a category that people know and love um, and a category that also – is full of junk. And so what we decided to do was take a nugget, reformulate it with only a few simple ingredients, make sure that it has the best nutritional profile of any nugget in the market, and use it as our first launch to build this brand that's really focused on making plant-based meats that are healthier. And that, that to us, we think is the next iteration of the, of the movement, like plant-based meats version one, where the quinoa and black bean burgers we, we know and love. They took whole plant-based ingredients and made uh, some sort of facsimile of, of these product categories. But honestly, they fell flat for a lot of people in taste and the experience of what people expect from, from something like a nugget or, or a burger. The V2, we've used all of our tools in our food science toolkit to, re to replicate the sort of organoleptic properties that people are looking for. And we get burgers that bleed, for example. Uh, the problem is there's a lot of complexity um, there are a lot of foreign ingredients. There are a lot of binders and fillers and mm. preservatives in all those products. They're great. I love them. I consume them all the time. 
But I think the next iteration is going to take all of the good of version one, the clean label, the simplicity, the good, the good health, and all of the joyous and mouthwatering, crave-worthy indulgence of V2 into a version three of plant-based meat that gets all of the good without all of the bad. So you're declaring the start of uh, V3, the plant-based revolution with, with, Nowadays, with the nuggets, right. <laughs> Mike, I'm gonna you're gonna be my. That's an audacious. Story. That's an audacious uh, de- declaration. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. At the end of the day, I want all these products to exist in the market. My issue is that we don't have a diversity of value propositions to consumers. So today, you have a value proposition for sustainability. You have plant-based meat companies in the market saying this is the sustainable option. Pay more money, sac- make some sacrifices on maybe the clean label, on maybe the health, on maybe. At the end of the day, you know, be a climate warrior at dinner. And that's amazing. I just don't think that there are enough climate warriors at dinner to scale these products uh, at the rate that we need to scale them. There are many, many plant-based meat companies out there who are saying, eat, uh, be an animal rights activist for breakfast. That's amazing. I'm an animal rights activist at breakfast myself. Uh, And so that's great. I just worry that we need more diverse value propositions to grow this sector as a whole. And right now, the biggest challenge is we don't have plant-based meat companies coming out saying, this is the exact same experience you're going to get from, for example, a chicken nugget, but it's going to be way better for you. Forget about the planet. Forget about animals. Forget about all of this. This is actually just a better product for you. Yeah. I mean, when I look at like impossible and beyond, right, we'll, we'll start with beef. We could get to the, the competitors on the nug side, nugget side, but like, I don't necessarily see Pat Brown or Ethan saying, um, you know, let's be climbing. I mean, when you talk to hear Pat Brown talk, like that's his whole mission, right? But like the goal for impossible was to entice meat eaters and not necessarily convince them that they, Hey, um, let's, let's save animals. Like they, they'll, they'll talk about that messaging. But if you look at their first advertisement it's all about, this is a burger. It's an awesome burger. It tastes like a burger. Um, so, yes. so yep. like, I don't feel like they're really trying to like hit you on the head with that. Let's save the animals message. No. So yeah, Pat, definitely impossible is, is I think impossible is a climate technology company. I love them. Pat Brown's amazing. You go to their website, top of fold is their impact report. Uh, Pat Brown said he's going to end animal agriculture in the next, I think, 15 years. And they've been unabashedly pro-GMO. Their their position is we need to use every single tool in our toolkit to curb the climate crisis. And I love that. I am an enthusiastic, impossible supporter. They're one of my favorite companies in the world. Um, I still am concerned, though, that that's not the best value proposition to reach a huge percentage of the market. They go, they, so they've turned to, yeah, they're focused on taste. They just ran their first TV, national TV campaign, and it's just them grilling burgers. And I love that too. My one question is, you know, how far are you going to get to get people to switch from a product they know and love and already like the taste of if you're just saying this tastes good? A food company can't be built on a value proposition of just taste. Uh, you need to do more than that. And impossible. So you can do taste, you can do price, you can do convenience, you can do health. There are a whole plethora of value props you can make. The What I want more of in the world is food companies that are making value propositions around health. Mm-hmm. One in five deaths globally is diet related. It's 2021. We can't even feed ourselves. We're in the US dealing with one of the worst public health crises ever. Um, and so in my mind, the way that we can actually have a foothold in the market is by creating a healthier product, not a more sustainable product, not a obviously a tastier product, but I think that's a really, mm-hmm. really, really long, long battle. So you're leading with healthier, and you're making this plant-based nugget. You're not the first. I mean, there is Rebellious, um, based here in Seattle. There's Nugs, which I think they're main, maybe named something before Nugs. But uh, how would you compare yourself to your peer group in, in the chicken nugget plant-based chicken nugget world? Yeah, I love. So I love all of these companies. I'm good friends with Christy, Legaliet, um, Rebellious. I think at the end of the day, anyone who's trying to scale affordable, accessible, uh, delicious plant-based meats, like hell yes, let's do everything we can to support them. I think one of the challenges across the space is there aren't products on the market today that really do deliver on a clean label, that really have a few simple ingredients and that have a really unparalleled nutritional profile. And so for us, I think it goes without saying you have to compete on taste. Of course, all of these, com- all of these products 
I think are trying to compete on delivering that type of flavor and mouthfeel and that overall experience. But that's not enough. And for, for us, I think what, what we have is a nugget that has the best nutritional profile and the cleanest ingredient list of any nugget. I don't think of our competitor set as rebellious and nugs. Um, if you're fighting for one percent of the market, you're you're in the wrong ring. We're going after chicken nuggets, and in order to do that, in order to go after really the 99 percent of the market, what we're doing is saying that most of these nuggets are full of junk, and that this nugget is not just competing with you on taste, and not just competing with you on convenience, and not just competing with you on price, but this nugget is actually better for you in a way that the existing competitive set of animal-based nuggets, just it's a claim that those that, that set can't make. Mm-hmm. So you talked about really emphasizing clean label. I think you, you alluded to Impossible's GMO status, which I think they get through, you know, the precision fermentation technology. Are you ruling out precision fermentation, as which I think a lot of people would classify as GMO, not some people wouldn't. Are you ruling that out as a future ingredient technology? We're not ruling anything out right now. I think the what we're trying to do is listen to consumers and try to think ahead of where we're actually how we're actually going to capture a huge share of the market. And for us right now, that's having no genetically modified organisms in our food products. I nevertheless think that there are all kinds of tools in the GMO toolkit that are are terrific tools. So we're not ruling anything out, but right now we have we're non-GMO, and that's mainly consumer-driven. The other the other thing that we don't have noticeably in our product that most of our plant-based friends have is is soy. And we started with a soy prototype. Uh, the company got off the ground with a soy nugget, and one of the things we did was listen to a lot of consumers who are looking at ingredient lists and are concerned yeah. about the ingredients in their foods. And and honestly. Soy free was a big surprise and a big pushback to us. And we realized one of the things we need to do was use pea protein instead. So a lot of this is just, we know these are products that the world needs. We know these are products that the market wants, but we really are trying to listen to our customers and have them tell us, like, here are our expectations. And honestly, between us and everyone in this room, the customer is often wrong, but always right. I mean, the stuff that I've heard people say to me about what they expect from their food is is sometimes ridiculous. Um, but we're not in the business of changing people's hearts or minds about science or climate or animal suffering. We're in the business of changing what's on people's plates. And for me, that means we have to deliver a product that, that speaks to them and that they care about. And so, yeah. So for right now, no GMOs. Yeah, you're a young startup. You don't have you know, whatever impossible's raised or beyond, like you can't billion, you, you can't like lather the world with like marketing to change everyone's mind. That's not your job. You're going to go with the path of least resistance. I think it makes sense. There's definitely an anti-soy kind of uh, sentiment out there. That's kind of hit the zeitgeist. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, you said you reached your round with though, with the soy nugget recipe pivoted to pea protein. Can you talk about your funding and your backers and all? Yeah, I can name some of our backers. So we just closed our pre-seed round. Uh, we've brought in a couple of million dollars and we are, um, backed by some amazing funds. Uh, Veg Invest in New York has a huge portfolio of alternative protein companies, Stray Dog Capital as well. Um, and then Tenacious Ventures is a food tech and ag tech fund, uh, that has participated in, in both of our funding rounds. And then, um, the last one that I can name is called Cornucopian Capital. It's actually a really interesting new fund that was started by the family that uh, created SlimFast, mm. sold, sold SlimFast to Unilever um, back in the day, focused very much on scaling healthy um, healthy foods. Great. So we have with us, just to reset the room, Max Elder. I've gotten to know Max for the past couple of years. I think we met Max first like four years ago at, at an event in San Francisco mm. when you were with the Institute for the Future, and you left your – your cozy uh, party uh, party going gig as a futurist like last year, and you you found it nowadays. And I do want people who, if you have questions for Max as he's about building his plant based food brand, uh, feel free to raise your hand. We'll bring some people up on stage. But just just you know, looking at your first product nuggets, do you have another a, an idea for the next product in mind, or are you going to stick with chicken nuggets for a while? Yes. Oh, so many products. We are not a nugget company. We just want to launch with a nugget, but we are definitely already working on R&D for our next product. The 
the next product that we're going to release is a gluten-free version. Um, one of the amazing things about our product is that we don't use gluten in our extrusions. So we don't actually use gluten in the formulation of the meats. We just have whole wheat breading. So we'll, we'll launch a gluten-free version soon. And then um, we're focused on chicken. I'm, I'm deeply concerned about chicken. I'm deeply, deeply concerned about both the suffering of, of broiler chickens around the world. We kill about 66 billion of them globally. Um, but also, I just think that there, it's a huge environmental crisis. Uh, and so we are focused on other formats of chicken products using our proprietary blend of, of pea protein and ingredients to extrude whole cuts of meat. So the next product is going to be a tender. Oh, nice. Um, and and then we we've been exploring, and I want to hear your opinion on this. We've been exploring a a larger like breast, not a patty, um, mm-hmm. but kind of a schnitzel in for for the U.S. market. Yeah, I'm all for. It. I mean, most of the things I've seen in the the generation two plant based chicken is the nuggets and the basically the kind of the burger patty or the the patty, if you will. So mm-hmm. I'm interested in your move towards whole cuts. I think that's definitely interesting. I'd love to taste it and see what the mouthfeel is. I mean, obviously, and this isn't like to degrade what you're doing, but I think anything that is kind of trying to replicate fried with like a crusty breading around it. That's like a, it's like salt. Like you can really get a lot, a long way there. And, and, you know, with our palates in, the, in America, like we're definitely optimized towards that. And you put a little bit of cheese on that crusty, you know, uh, bready, bready nugget. It's going to taste pretty good. Right. So uh, I'm yeah. curious to see what the whole cut looks like and how you get there from a mouthfeel perspective and a taste perspective. Yep. Yep. Well, Mike, I mean, it's one important thing to mention there is you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the, I think interesting things about the whole meat market and how companies enter it is this isn't, this is a mongrel market. It's not, it's not one market. And I think there are good reasons why it's going to take us a long time, for example, to have a a naked breast of chicken or a filet of fish or, or even for that matter, like a a steak burgers are sandwiches. Um, Nuggets are breaded and fried. And I think for us and nowadays we want to have impact at scale yesterday and the approach is to be a little more nuanced in how we think about the market. We're focused on junk food meats. These are processed meats. Nuggets honestly barely come from chicken in the first place. Uh, and the chicken that they do come from is very low quality. And so for us, there's like there's no good reason why a nugget comes from such a dirty supply chain, such an inhumane supply chain, and why it's so unhealthy. Uh, and so we're nowadays, in terms of the overall product roadmap, we're only focused on innovating in categories that are junk food categories that use low co- quality meats that are breaded and fried and frozen. Cause to me, those are the types of that that's the market that we can really flip upside down tomorrow. There's much more longer term and interesting possibilities with other technologies, with other forms of, of production. Um, but to me, it's like, God, we can't wait 15 years for some of these things to come around. We can scale yeah. clean label meats um, using plants yesterday. Yeah. And we have Dr. Christopher up. So I want to ha- have him ask a question just a second here, but I definitely think like, there's nothing wrong with like going after that huge market for junk food and, and breaded and fried stuff. Like I, I love that food. I just know I can't eat it cause it's very unhealthy for me. But if you give me a healthy <laughs> plant-based version, I'm all in on that. So I, that, I think it's a great thing. So uh, Dr. Christopher, you have a question for Max? I do. Um, awesome. Max, uh, uh, congratulations on all your success. Thank I you. Was, um, you're very welcome. Yeah. And it's great to see motivated uh, people creating awesome alternatives uh, that people uh, in maybe lower economic thresholds um, can potentially adapt into their diet. So it's always great to see these types of products. Um, I was wondering, have you two? I have two questions. The first question is, um, you know, I consider this an ultra processed food compared to chicken or meat like it's either meat or chicken it's just a slab of meat and you're eating it have you ever done a dynamic equilibrium kind of the equasive model of what the price is per nutrient uh when you when you um as a way as a form of marketing have you ever looked at that of like the the price per nutrient and the cost to produce that nutrient comparison to the plant base is my first question Hmm. No, we haven't. Um, but, you know, I think it's an interesting the, the real question in my mind is like, is it a is that a helpful thing for consumers? Is that how consumers think about when they go down to at 
eight o'clock at night, they're making a convenient snack. Is that is that a type of uh, important value proposition to them? Yeah, I, I was just I was just curious about that. And and my my other my other question is is your nutrition fact panel looks like a standard nutrition fact panel that was kicked out based on you guys inputting the ingredients and kicking out a nutrition fact panel. Is this an actualized nutrition fact panel or is this something that came that was just kicked out of a system? This was a third party system. It's not actualized yet. Are you But we ever, didn't do it ourselves. Are you going to actualize it? Is yes. that something Cool. Of course. Yeah. We're going to actualize it. We're also going to um, apply for a child nutrition label. We're really focused on scaling this towards – I mean this is a food that's beloved by kids. So we're excited about long-term food service and getting into schools. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot, lot, lot on the horizon with figuring out how to make a good, good value proposition around junk food without junk. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting because the plant-based, a lot of these alternatives – um, you know, as you know, there's if I was to actually take your product and send it off to Eurofins right now, there potentially could be up to a 20 percent variancy based on your nutrition fact panel. And I feel like it's something that would be ideal for a lot of these plant based alternatives to actualize their nutrition fact panel. Um, I, I think that's essential. Yeah, no, I agree. I think everyone does. I think it's just uh, it, it takes time. That's all. But cool. I'm. From my impression, talking with folks, most people start with a nutrition, fa uh, start doing the calculations with a third party. They get the numbers back. And then once they have sort of commercial runs up, they get it actualized. So some of this is just a matter of time. Cool. Awesome. I'm going to uh, try some of your products. So I appreciate uh, th th Thank you for bringing this to the forefront, Michael. Of course. And thank you, as always, for jumping on stage. I appreciate your questions. So you alluded a little bit, Max, to getting it to market. I think my impression is you're going direct to consumer initially with a website. So talk about the rollout. Is it is it kind of the traditional DTC playbook website and then maybe moving into retail as you establish relationships and then food service? <laughs> Mike, who told you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. We love – we're launching D2C. Um, when we set all of this strategy up, we were in the peak of the pandemic and – D2C is amazing. It's amazing the amount of control you have. It's amazing the amount of data and visibility you get. And it's really just an amazing channel to launch a new brand. So I view our D2C rollout really as a sort of six-month uh, sales channel with um, really optimizing for insights and learning. So we're launching just in California. We are growing intentionally and slowly. We are figuring out all of the kinks. Um, and we're learning a lot about our product and market fit. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that startups face early on is they take in a bunch of money and they try to uh, grow very, very quickly and they move they move fast and they break a lot of things. We are trying to do things a little bit differently. So we're rolling out um, direct to consumer. We launched today with our pre-orders, which will be available for the next two weeks. Um, and then we'll spend the the next six months really focusing on um, product market fit in California, A-B testing all of our messaging, figuring out how to scale manufacturing. And at the end of this year, we will um, we'll basically be able to enter larger retail contracts. We see ourselves primarily as a retail brand. Retail is a little bit of a mess right now. Uh, and those contracts are, are hard to get into unless you really can prove that you're going to come in and drive velocity. So, um, so yeah, D to C first to get started and learn as much as we can spend most of our efforts next year on uh, retail. And then ultimately food service is where I think, you know, we can have really big impact. The challenge is that food service contracts are won primarily on cost, particularly for categories for, for products like nuggets. Um, so you have to go toe to toe with, with products that are heavily subsidized nuggets uh, across a lot of institutional procurement um, plans are, are basically free. So we need to scale. It's going to take us maybe about two years to be able to really compete at a large scale with those kinds of volumes. Um, but God, my my goal is we, we can't be a D to C nugget brand. Um, we need to be a a retail plant based meat company that has a diversity of products that are that are not just incrementally better, but actually like a 10x improvement on 
the product ingredients and the nutrition facts. Uh, and we need to be at scale so that we can be in school districts, that we can be in hospitals, so that we can be at um, sports uh, arenas that we're everywhere. Yep. And that's the main, the vision and the whole business model behind nowadays is really cheap, low capex and fast approach to scaling manufacturing. It's the, it's really the like the innovation behind all of this is is a new approach to product development that enables us to scale very quickly and very cheaply, um, which is the whole the whole strategy to having impact. So you, you said you raised around a couple million, you're going to DTC first. And I usually see these, these moving phases, um, the initial rollout and, and kind of your, your beta testing, not, not really beta testing, but doing AB testing with your initial consumer sets in California, probably funded by this first round. I would imagine for that scale up, you're going to have to raise some more money. So you talk a little bit about this. Was this the first time you've raised money and kind of, where are you? You, you already see seeking your next round. We raised a bit of money in the beginning. Uh, Veg Invest and Tenacious Ventures gave, uh, invested money to get this company off the ground. We literally uh, this week closed our pre-seed round, and we are headed to exactly uh, exactly that. Headed to a much larger round at the end of this year to really scale. So we'll be doing a large a large seed round uh, in Q4, and that's really going to be after we've proven the product and uh, basically the model. And we're going to raise a bunch of money at the end of the year to scale it, uh, enter new channels, but really get out of California and and um, hopefully also get out of the US. I mean, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of, there's a big opportunity in Europe for this kind of product. Uh, yeah, I think even perhaps more so than in the US. Uh, and one of the beauties of the, the approach is that we're able to really replicate cuts of meat first and then ship them to uh, value add plants that finish those products um, very cheaply and very, very easily. So the whole, the model is, is designed at the end of this year to raise enough money to be able to, to scale um, definitely nationwide. Um, But we're, our sites are set outside of the country. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, do you have some idea? So it sounds like your, your strategy for scaling, scaling to higher volumes is you're actually going to make the whole cuts first. And those are those going to be what you ultimately send to third contract manufacturers to make the, the kind of the breaded finished product nugget, or are you yeah. alluding about it to a next generation product? No, this product. So one of the things we haven't really discussed, I think is price. And I'm deeply concerned that one of the largest barriers to being able to have an oversized impact in the meat market is that a lot of these alternative protein companies just aren't going to be able to get their costs down to be able to really compete with, granted, an artificially cheap product in the market. Um, chicken is, of course, the worst culprit. It's it's the cheapest protein you can get. Um, and so that's a really hard market to enter with a product that costs significantly more to, to manufacture. One of the reasons that these products cost so much more to manufacture is not only because of their complexity in how in in their ingredients. So it's, it's a lot because it costs more money to pay someone to make a nugget with 42 ingredients than it does to make a nugget with six. Um, mm-hmm. But more practically, actually, the manufacturing is very challenging. So some folks in the space are trying to solve that by coming up with their own approaches to manufacturing. Um, some folks are, are trying to do that by bringing manufacturing in house and, and really trying to um, more vertically integrate the we're doing something very different, which is the meat industry exists today and has production lines that are very cheap and very very efficient and very ubiquitous. And what we're doing is we're extruding pea protein into whole cuts of meat that have the mm. um, flavor, the texture, the mouthfeel of a, of a piece of chicken, a cut of chicken. And we are then shipping those to co-manufacturers to finish. But that finishing line for a co-man, when they get a cut of meat, is battering, breading, frying, and freezing. That that production line, Mike, exists in your basement right now. I mean, it's everywhere. <laughs> I and know it's that. already being used. It's already being used yeah. by the meat industry. And so our vision is to plug into existing uh, production lines that, that are cheap and efficient, not recreating the wheel that the meat industry has already um, done such a great job um, making uh, very efficient and just replacing the meat. So in, in, in many ways, we're actually like, we're replacing the farming and the meat packing. What comes out of a, of a Tyson factory is a cut of, of chicken that then gets sent to um, a Cargill that gets sent to a value add plant. Um, we can do the same thing. 
I will. Uh, I do want people to. If the, you have a couple questions that you want to ask Max, feel free to raise your hand. We'll take a couple more. Um, you and not just to kind of reset. You announced today nowadays, and this is your startup. You co-founded with Dominique Krabinski. You came out at the uh, F- uh, Institute for the Future, and uh, you you guys raised some money. Is it how, how many people are with the company? Is it just you and Dominic and a few others contractors? What does the company uh, profile look like right now? Yeah, the company is our two founders. We have a bunch of amazing service providers. They're contractors from creative studios to performance marketing teams. To, we have a director of marketing um, and we have a bunch of food scientists. We've been really heavily relying on our partners and um, honestly, Mike, our, our network. So Dominic and I have Dominic has three decades of experience in the food industry. He, he's been working in the food industry for, for as long as I've been um, walking this rock. Um, but both of us have a great network of folks and it's been really um, we've been very lucky and very privileged and very fortunate enough to be able to move mountains without hiring um, dozens of folks. The other sort of beauty of launching direct to consumer is D 2 C brands can launch very lean. Um, so we're hiring. Uh, we are hiring now uh, to grow the team. But for now, it's been us, um, a, a, a marketing team and honestly, an amazing advisory board. Uh, we've been really approaching growing early, a little bit different than lots of folks. We've brought on advisors um, for uh, a part time. Uh, they're all folks who are either you know CEOs of food companies. Liz Fisher is one of our advisors, the CEO of Lava, a plant-based dairy company. Um, to just like amazing individuals, Earthen Cousins, she's the former ambassador to the FAO under Obama and then was the head of the World Food Program. Um, these kinds of folks are on our advisory board and we talk to them every week and they they move mountains for us. Soon though, we're going to need to bring on some staff and, and we are about to hire, um, we just posted today, a job for an amazing community manager. So we're growing our marketing and customer success team. Exciting. So people can find that at what's the websites? Can you eat nowadays.com eat nowadays.com. And I just, can you go back a little bit? And I just want to hear, you know, when you guys developed the recipe, mm. who was doing the work that we're using third party consultants mm. was Dominique, the guy coming out, you know, came out yes. of Cargill. We see the guy saying this, this is what we should do. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the roles you each had? Yes, of course. Yeah, Dominic is our is the sort of t- science and technology. Um, he's your tactical of, founder. He's a technical founder. He's the one who's spent his career in food manufacturing. So he was the one who formulated the nugget. We also worked closely with one of our advisory board members named Bill Amutis. Bill was the head of external innovation at Cargill for many years, and now he runs the North Carolina Food Innovation Lab, which is an amazing group in North Carolina that's focused on plant based food innovation. It's a PhD food scientist. Um, and then we've been working with Bueller, uh, the yep. world's experts in extrusion. Um, and Bueller has done a lot of – done amazing things. Uh, extrusion, I'm not sure if you're familiar, Mike, but is a, is a wild, wild west, <laughs> um, pretty wild approach to um, turning proteins and fibers into meat analogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it is kind of the secret sauce of our technology. It's like the scale, it's a scaled industrial version of 3d printing essentially, right? Yes. Um, but a lot like less sexy and yeah. a lot louder, a lot louder. Yeah. Well, this has uh, really been great to hear about what you're building, Max. I've, I've been kind of curious since you went stealth and, and, and kind of alluded to the fact that you're building a company like when you left Institute for the Future. So it's always great to hear when you lift up the veil, what you're building how does it feel to lift up the veil and tell the world what you're doing? Is it a relief? Is it, is it, can you get some sleep now or, or less? Sleep? Uh, I, I feel a little naked. Like <laughs> I feel like the veil's lifted. No, I mean, it's, it's been, we're so lucky and we're so privileged. We have such amazing people and uh, we've been able to do an immense amount. We incorporated as a public benefit corporation on August 25th of last year. We've, we've basically gone from, not even full time, but just company incorporation to launching our first product in in less than nine months, I think, mm-hmm. which is pretty unprecedented. So we've been we're very lucky and fortunate. And the most amazing thing is to now start talking with all kinds of folks about what we're building because we have grand ambitions. And now that we can actually 
uh, talk publicly and start selling product. I think the I'm just so excited to figure out how to get these nuggets and all of our products that we're going to launch this year uh, onto more plates. And really, really, really not vegan plates, not vegetarian plates. Like this isn't a company for me. I, I'm like a, um, a happy, healthy, um, uh, like well off white male in San Francisco. This is like not where I am not the target audience for this. I'm trying to get nowadays into um, hearts, minds and freezers across the country for folks who are eating chicken nuggets every day, who are not feeling good, who feel guilt and shame. There's like way too much guilt and shame in all of this. And so for me, I'm just like so thrilled and excited to start talking with everyone and figuring out how to have impact and how to use nowadays as a way not only to, of course, return, uh, produce a lot of returns for our our shareholders, but also focus a lot, um, given our public benefit corporation status on all of our stakeholders and figuring out how to really track and communicate our social and environmental good. So I'm very, very, very excited. Great. So everyone follow Max. If you haven't already, uh, keep an eye on what he's building uh, on the soil. Uh, you probably click on your, your, your profile and get his social, but Max, we'll keep an eye on what you're building. And I thank you for telling us about what you're, what you're, what you built with nowadays. And we're excited to see where you go. Thanks so much, Mike. This has been fun. It's nice chatting with you, by the way. I know stealth sucks because we, <laughs> we haven't talked, so it's nice to hear your I voice. got my double vaccination. I got my second Moderna, so I'm ready to jump on a plane and go to San Francisco. So we'll, we'll connect. Let's do it. We got plenty of nuggets for you when you come down. All right, man. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining, and uh, we'll talk to everyone soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks, all. Bye.